As for Christopher Baines, uh, he had grown up middle class in Maywood, Illinois. When he was 19, he got 18 years in prison for running, supervising a crack ring in Bloomington, Indiana. And when he got out of prison in the early 2000s, he briefly was, was cutting hair, but then he uh, got back into the business. And Baines likes to refer uh, in some statements he made to gangbangers as, quote, uh, most street guys that are in gangs are idiots. They can only get so far. I never got involved in gang activity. I never hung with gangbangers. Now, Baines may not have hung with gangbangers, but he sure sold heroin to them, including members of the traveling vice lords on Chicago's west side, hence the federal prosecutor's statement that I referenced at the beginning of the video. Now, Fat Mike King died before he actually had to testify against the Flores brothers or anybody else, and Christopher Baines wouldn't talk, but the case against the Flores twins was uh, proceeding, and the heat was on their organization in Chicago. So the heat is on the Flores twins in Chicago, and the heat is sort of on them in Mexico because they're the cash cows that the Beltran Leva and the Sinaloa cartel are one of the cash cows that those two groups are killing thousands of people over. And they, through some intermediary, get in touch with the DEA and they have the meeting in, in 08 that I referenced in Monterey, Mexico, and they, they, they make a deal. We're gonna help you get El Chapo if you protect us and you make sure we don't get a long prison term and the deal that the Flores brothers worked out is pretty, pretty mind-boggling. Now, when word hit the streets that the twins were cooperating with the feds, their father, who was safely back in Little Village in Chicago, for some reason, and it was a, it was a very bad decision, he decided to go down to Mexico. I don't know, was it tried to try to save face or what, but he disappeared within a couple days and was never found. Of course, he's been murdered. So the Flores twins' cooperation led to their own father immediately getting killed down in Mexico. Now, for those who don't know, drug offenders that become informants don't just have to flip on people above them. They can roll up their whole operation, meaning people below them. They can set up their own customers, and that's just what the Flores twins did. The people that the Flores twins set up range from older Puerto Ricans in Chicago to young black guys from Detroit. Now here's a description of just a few of the, the deals they set up. They got people nabbed by the DEA of their own old customers. December 1st, 2008, a guy known as Old Man pulls up to an Outback Steakhouse in Calumet, a suburb of Chicago. The DEA grabbed him with 20 kilos of cocaine. T Money owed the Flores twins money. But then he got a call from them saying to just bring them 20,000 and they would bring him 10 more kilos on consignment. He gets wrapped up by the feds. A guy named D who owed the twins 40,000, he was told just to bring a little bit of money and they would give him uh, 10 keys on consignment to get him back started so he could pay off the debt. He shows up at a dollar store, he feels like something is fishy, but it's too late. He's taken into custody. Next up was JT from Detroit, who was living in Atlanta at that time, and he also owed the twins money, despite having a Lamborghini that he would show up in Chicago with to cap dope. So JT's down in Atlanta, he gets a call from the twins, telling, them, telling him they're back in action, and that he can come pick up 10 bricks on consignment in Chicago if he just brings them $45,000. It sounded too good to be true, and it was. And when, when JT sent one of his runners to do the deal in Chicago, he got snatched up. All in all, 10 customers of the Flores twins were caught in the dragnet the DEA set up in Chicago during the first week of December 08. All 10 of them were people that owed the twins money or had a reputation for being sloppy or hot or running their mouth. So. Really, the people the Flores twins set up were bums that they had already cut off. They didn't set up their real customers, but the DEA didn't care. They got their numbers. 
After the Flores brothers set up that big round of customers and their father popped up dead, everyone on the street, everyone in Mexico knew that they were working with the feds. They went into witness protection. And uh, one more piece of evidence of just how important the Flores twins were. When they were on the street, wholesale prices of cocaine in Chicago were about $18,000. They immediately shot up to $29,000. And to this day, I know in Detroit at least, uh, kilo of cocaine is in the high 30s, if not $40,000, if you can get it. Another disturbing component of this is that the Flores twins apparently kept selling drugs even while they were in federal custody, and not just to people that they were setting up. In a 2011 trial of some case in the Sinaloa cartel, because there's a lot of sub-cases going on and that have already been adjudicated, one of their delivery drivers testified that he was making deliveries to people uh, orchestrated by the Flores twins while they were in custody, and these were not to people that ever got arrested. And Pedro Flores was able to even get his wife a brand new 2009 Bentley, a $100,000 gift for her birthday while they were in custody. One lawyer for the defense complained that the government was withholding info that questioned the credibility of the Flores twins as witnesses. We know that there are witnesses that have been interviewed here in the Chicago area who talk about the reputation of them as murderers, thieves, and liars. No one trusts the Flores brothers, no one. And we know that the government gave enormous benefits to the Flores brothers families, including the ability to keep their ill-gotten gains while they were working with the government and that agents in Chicago knew all about the situation. But of course, when you're getting to arrest El Chapo in your jurisdiction, that's good for all those federal agents and federal prosecutors' careers. So who cares what the Flores twins were doing and who cared if they kept some of their money and who cared if they were still selling cocaine and heroin from federal custody? Vicente Zambada, the son of El Mayo and third in command of the Sinaloa cartel, was probably the Flores twins' first major casualty. He was brought into custody in 09. Now at first, Zambada maintained a defense that he himself had been working with the DEA and all the deals he was doing uh, weren't criminal events because basically he and the Sinaloa cartel were being allowed by the Mexican government and the DEA to control the Mexican or take over the Mexican drug trade in order to reduce violence. So he went along with that defense for a while, which frankly I believe could be true, but of course no U.S. federal court was going to accept that. So ultimately he made a plea deal. He, he agreed to testify on the stand, which he will be doing against El Chapo. He's provided information about his own father, but his father's not in custody and Vicente Zambada himself, just him, he turned in nearly $1.4 billion in assets as part of his plea deal, and he's expected to get about 10 to 15 years in prison once his testimony against El Chapo is complete. The Flores twins got sentenced to 14 years in prison. Now, mind you, all these people have been in custody since 08, 09, so with good, you know, a couple years off for good time, this and that, Zambada and the Flores twins are gonna be walking around free very, very soon. They may be already. The plea agreement that the Flores twins entered into uh, had them admitting to being involved with distributing an astounding 64,000 kilograms of heroin and cocaine. And again, they only received 14 years in prison. But mind you, their prison is witness protection it's, who knows, they might be living, have been living in a house or an apartment. They probably were and they may be free now. As for the impact of the case against the Flores twins, El Chapo and the Sinaloa cartel in general, uh, cocaine availability and seizures has declined in the United States since then. Certainly in the Midwest, prices are way up. But the availability of crystal meth, which is manufactured in Mexico, has gone way up and has as we all know and we see on the nightly news wherever you live in the country, we're now in the worst opioid epidemic which is killing far more people than cocaine ever did. 
and uh, a lot of it is Mexican heroin coming up across the border from the new cartels that have sprung up to replace El Chapo in the Sinaloa cartel. El Mayo is still operating and you have people like the Jalisco New Generation Cartel which are even uh, more murderous and brutal than the Sinaloa Cartel or the Beltran Leva brothers or the Ariano Felix brothers and the Mexican drug war had died down a little bit in the last couple of years, but in 2018, Mexico, cities like Tijuana have set new records for homicide, surpassing even that of years back at the height of the drug war. So the U.S. government cut a lot of corners. They let people like the Flores brothers continue to sell drugs or at least continue to benefit from their ill-gotten gains while in custody, receive relatively light prison sentences, and all for what? 